We're joined today by Abby Elger, who is our Director of Digital Communications, also at the Leadership Institute. Abby, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Patty. Uh, our topic of the day is online tactics for offline action, something that everyone is interested in but isn't quite sure how to effectively put it into action. Abby is here today to talk to us about it and to teach us how. Abby, what do you have for us today? Well, I have a lot of stuff, so we'll move through it pretty quickly. Um, of course, we welcome questions at any time. What's the best way to submit questions, Patty? The best way to submit questions throughout the entire lecture is to email live at leadershipinstitute.org. And from time to time, that email address will pop up on your screen. They'll come directly to me, and I will ask Abby your questions. Great. So submit questions to Patty, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, online activism starring you, the internet, and dogs. So even if you don't enjoy the PowerPoint, maybe you'll stay for the dog photos. Um, so I always like to start presentations like this by going over what social media has changed and what it hasn't changed. So what has changed? First, um, it's changed sort of the nature of communications relationships. If you think about TV and the way that TV works, it's a one-to-many relationship. There's one Dan Rather, one Megyn Kelly, one Bill O'Reilly, and many of us watching the TV either thumbs-upping it or yelling at it, depending on your point of view, and which host is on the air. So that's a one-to-many relationship. The difference with online communications and how you can really leverage it is that it's many one-to-one -one relationships. When I post a Facebook status update, it's an individual update to the thousand friends I have on Facebook. It's many times of a one-to-one -one connection. It's also changed the nature of gatekeepers. They didn't disappear, but they now exist differently. And we'll talk in a minute how this is actually great news for conservatives. It's given us analytic information. Previously, you could know that you wrote a book and a certain number of people bought it, or rather a certain number of copies were sold. You published an op-ed in a newspaper that had a certain number of circulation or a letter to the editor. Now you can find out who views your message, how long they stay on it, and what they did with that information. It's also led to an explosion of consumer choice. No longer do I have you know, one news station, one weather channel, and one network that's going to give me my TV drama. I have hundreds of thousands of websites to visit and hundreds if not thousands of news sources for information that I care about. It's also changed expectations in, in terms of how we communicate. It used to be at 24 hours to respond to a crisis. Now it's probably about 24 seconds. So our expectations now are one, immediacy. It's a world of instant gratification, for better or for worse. And also authenticity, because remember, it's one-to-one -one connections occurring many times. When you connect with a person, you make a personal connection with a real person. And we want to see that carried through elsewhere online. So what has social media not changed? It hasn't changed our goals in politics. We still want to get our guys or gals elected, our laws passed, whatever else it may be. It hasn't changed the political process mostly. Yes, we have new tools, but we have new tools that allow us to do things we've always done more effectively. Communicating our, our message, persuading people, targeting voters, you know, insert X, Y, Z for wherever issue you care about and work, work on the most. It hasn't changed the rules of human behavior at all, for good or for evil hasn't changed the rules of good communication. Good writing is good writing. And that sort of sums up. And this is the world we now live in. Um, this is from Edelman, uh, which is a major PR firm. I didn't make it up. I always like to give them credit. And they say we now live in a world of the media cloverleaf, and it's four overlapping spheres. The upper left-hand corner is tradi traditional media. That's the media we think of as the alphabet soup. Fox News, ABC, NBC, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times sort of the mainstream media sources. The upper right-hand corner is a rise of new types of publications. They're the tradigital publications, and those are ones that exist predominantly online, but will frequently break news, uh, publish major news stories, have the weight and credibility of all the mainstream media sources. Bottom right-hand corner, social media, Facebook, Twitter, all the places where we talk to each other about things we care about or are interested in. Bottom left-hand corner is owned media. That's spaces that your organization, campaign, whatever it may be, owns and controls online. It's the corners of the internet where you manage it and you tell your story directly. And somewhere in these four overlapping spheres is where we're actually communicating online. It may be a mainstream news story that breaks, that's then picked up and analyzed on a traditional publication, that's then passed around on social media, that a campaign then responds to on their website. And all four of those things are working all at once. So it's a really interesting interplay. 
So why is this good news for conservatives, as I mentioned previously? You sort of now see, with the rise of new gatekeepers, but also a shift in how stories are reported. I don't think I'm going to surprise anyone tuning into this webinar that the mainstream media is perhaps not so sympathetic to conservative points of view. The good news is we can now actually basically force them to cover the stories that are important to us, and this sort of shows how it happens. Stories, publishing them online, very, very easy to do. There's no barrier to publishing anymore. It's functionally free. It requires your time and an internet connection. And you can just hit the publish button, and there it is. And so what you'll find frequently is that stories that are published online will then start circulating. And if they get picked up enough, or you know, if you can think about an analogy of water on a stove. If there's enough heat and it starts boiling, then that water becomes boiling water, and you see the little steam rising off. In online communications, that's the story got enough energy on online publications and then got bumped up to the next level, which is the tradigital publication. If it gets enough attention, enough interplay, or enough play online in tradigital publications, it gets bumped up again to the mainstream media. This is actually something we see a lot at the Leadership Institute with our website, Campus Reform. It's campusreform.org, the report on breaking campus news stories. Unsurprisingly, local, state, national media aren't always eager to cover stories that campus reform will break about crazy professors, crazy administrators, um, harassing, silencing, intimidating conservative students. Campus reform, I think, at this point would fall in the realm of digital publication. They'll publish it online. It'll get passed around among other conservative activists who care about these issues. And then it'll break through to the mainstream media when it has a sufficient amount of attention and energy. And so the good news for conservatives is we can bump up through these three channels. So if you have a good story, you can make it happen. You can literally force the media to cover it. And some of this presentation will be talking about the actual process of doing that. I have a quick question. Sure. What qualities make these stories get those bumps that brings them from the uh, entry level of social media all the way up into mainstream media? So it's a combination of two factors, really. The first is obviously the content of the story. On campus reform, the stories that do the best are shocking or outrageous. Um, as Morton Blackwell, LA's president, says, you know, moral indignation is the most powerful motivating force in politics. So if you have a story that sort of incites that, that level of emotional response, that's probably what's going to get the most amount of play. Um, on the second level, it's not only the quality of the story, but how well you're doing in passing and sharing that story by building relationships online, which is what the second half of this presentation will talk about. Because you could be standing in the middle of the forest yelling Shakespeare, but if there's no one around to hear you, no one will appreciate what the story is. Same thing here. Um, really quick example I always like to give, especially because uh, Harvard, of all places, did a case study on this. Happy birthday. It's the story of Trent Lott at Strom Thurmond's birthday party. It was on C-SPAN. Um, he gives a few remarks. He makes an interesting remark about how if Strom Thurmond, who'd run as a Dixiecrat on a segregationist platform, had been elected president, maybe we wouldn't have all these problems. So what happens is it's made in a room full of reporters. No one really says anything about it. There's maybe some uncomfortable laughter, and it's over. However, one reporter put it up on a blog a few days later. I believe it was ABC News and uh, just mentioned it briefly. And then liberal bloggers took that story, and days after it happened, blew the story up. And we all know the end of the story, which is Trent Lott actually ended up resigning from the US Senate after two decades of service as a result of this story. So it was a story the mainstream media had in front of them, did not pick up, did not cover, but liberal bloggers picked up and, again, created that energy, that excitement, forced the media to cover it, and then forced a response. So how do you actually build your online strategy? This little dog will help us. Not really, he's just cute. Um, so how do you build your online strategy? There's a couple things to think about before you get into tools. The first is to be signal, not noise. So I come from a family of engineers. They aren't really sure how I happened. But I come from a family of engineers, all technical people. And so what's the difference between signal and noise? It's like you're driving, you're in your car, you're on the highway, going over a mountain, and you're singing along to the radio. And all of a sudden, you just hear, if you're me, like the sound of a cat dying. And you realize what's happened is the signal from the radio has been replaced by static, and the amazing singing that you heard was the singer on the radio and not actually yourself, which sounds like the cat dying. So the noise is that white noise, that static. The signal is the clear, pure, individual message. On the web, the great news is everyone can publish content. On the web, the bad news is everyone can publish content. So there's lots and lots and lots of stuff there. So you want to make sure that you're adding information, new information, to each conversation. Um, you're being that signal, not simply repeating information that's coming from another place. A couple questions to ask yourself, and we'll return to these at the end to walk through it. 
Um, first, what is your very specific goal? And this is where you tie online and offline. Like, what is your real life political goal? To get somebody elected, to force the media to cover a story, to force a politician to vote a certain way on a bill, whatever it is, to get a certain number of people at your rally in order to X, Y, Z. Pick your real world outcome that you want to see occur as a result of this. And the second, who is the decision maker? And you want to be very specific about this because this is the person you're going to try to influence. The nice thing is online tactics sort of give you uh, leverage or a fulcrum. So if you have a small group of dedicated people, you can exert outsized force and effects, which is great news. So figure out who you're trying to influence. Who are your natural allies in this? Um, people who care about these issues, people who have worked on these issues previously, bloggers or reporters who write on these issues and are always looking for good and juicy stories. How can you apply pressure? And this is where you can get really creative. Again, we'll talk about some examples at the end of the webinar. Now we're going to walk through the tools you'll have to figure out how to apply pressure in interesting and creative ways. So know your tools. Um, this is from a social media strategist, this model, Chris Brogan, B-R-O-G-A-N. Always like to give him credit as well. Um, and he calls it a home base and outpost. And it's the best way to think about all the social media tools that you have at your disposal. Your home base is your website or your blog or, you know, sort of pick this unifying presence where you have all the stuff about you in one place online. It may be um, your Facebook fan page, actually. It may be a simple blog you're running. It may be a single landing page. But it's the one place where you collect all the information relevant to your cause, campaign, or individual work as an activist. That's your home. And then below, you have all of these outposts where you're communicating with people. So this is your email list. This is your Facebook fan page, if that's not your home base already. This is Twitter. This is other social media, um, other website, that most old-fashioned of things, real-life networks where you talk to people face-to-face. -face. Um, go ahead. Just a question. Are there certain types of vendors uh, or technologies that are best to integrate all of these different things when you're using this matrix? Uh, what, using Facebook or Twitter, what makes it easiest to go back to a website and what kind of website should someone use that makes integrating easier? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think the easiest thing you're going to do if you're going to build a website is probably use WordPress. Um, it's free. It's really, really, really easy to install even if you have no technical knowledge or you can buy a web hosting package that will let you host it for free. Um, and then you create sort of little plugins to push people out to all these different channels and then pull them back in. So an example is on the Leadership Institute's website, we'll ask you to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. If you then go to our Facebook fan page or see our updates on Twitter, you'll see we're frequently pushing people back to our website and asking them to go return to there. So you sort of create this loop back and forth. Um, the good news is with a little bit of time, it's pretty easy to combine all of these pieces to at least have them working in a network. As far as evaluating how well they're working, the other good news for all of us is that there's a lot of good free tools that will show you, remember that analytic information we already talked about, um, how many people are visiting my website. You can use Google Analytics for that. So it's just google.com slash analytics. <coughs> Um, for Facebook, if you run a Facebook fan page, they have a tool called Insights that will show you, you know, how many people visited, where are they from, who likes me, uh, which sounds kind of sad in a way. Um, you know, how many people viewed this post. On Twitter, if you use a URL shortener, which we'll talk about a little bit later, you can see how many people have clicked links. So you can very easily sort of have all these pieces fitted together and then be reviewing the data. There are a few platforms you can use to manage social media in particular that will let you put all those metrics in one place. Um, a good example is Hootsuite, H-O-O-T-S-U-I-T-E, is a great way to combine all of those accounts, put them together, and be able to measure their effectiveness. So let's talk about these tools one-on-one. -on -one. And again, this is sort of me like a 30,000-foot view, so I'll give you a resource at the end of every tool section for where you can go to dig in for more information. Your website and or a blog. Um, your mission there is to tell your story awesomely because this is sort of uh, your marketing materials, your brochure, but it should be more exciting, interesting, and lively than a printed brochure. It's your place to tell all about what you're doing, what you're working on, and why it matters. The most important thing to think about when you're telling the story, to tell it awesomely, is to think about the person who's reading it. It's not your story. You have to find a way to make it their story because after all, the most sweet word a person can hear, second to their own name, is the word you because it means you're talking about them. So find a way to draw them in, show them the benefits of getting involved in cause, campaign, whatever else it may be, and what sort of benefits will accrue to them as a result. 
Um, one cool thing, I pulled this from a site called Technorati. It's from 2010, but I think it shows some things we've seen that will ring true with your personal experience, let's put it that way. Of basically, public trust in traditional media sources is declining public faith in bloggers and independent news sources is rising. So we now live at this very unique juncture of if faith in traditional media is going down and faith in independent media or bloggers is going up, that's a great opportunity for conservatives because we often feel like the stories that we're working on, the candidates we care about, are being undersold in traditional media. So you can find a way to tell your story and there's an audience out there willing to listen to you and willing to give you credit. So what does it look like? How does this like, model work in reality of the home base and the outposts? Starting on the home base, you have a piece of content, so a single idea. Um, if you're working for an activist organization, this may be you know, the top 10 reasons Bill 10 is terrible, or um, the top five reasons we must repeal XYZ. If you're working for a campaign, it's the five reasons your opponent is terrible or the 10 reasons your candidate is super awesome. So you have that single piece of idea where you publish it online, and this is sort of like your, your lengthy, you can provide links, you can provide background information, you can show you've done your homework pretty much. It's like doing the math test in high school where you have to show every line of the equation. And then you can publish it in a lot of different places online in different formats. Um, so you go to Facebook and you include a graphic and a short link that will kick people back to your website. You include a few newsy type links on Twitter. You cleverly uh, do anything in the miscellaneous tools we don't have time to talk about today under the et cetera. Basically, you take that idea, you repackage it, and distribute it on those different platforms because ideas will travel easily online, and you want to help them do that traveling. Um, the example I like to use, which is very stupid, but people do remember it, is it's like an apple and seeds. The apple, it's your idea. The seeds are how you easily distribute ideas throughout the internet um, to form new apples. It works. So what are some good rules for web content? That's oh. a question. We're sure. talking about activism, uh, uh, online tactics for offline action. If you were going to be holding a rally, and that's your big idea, and say it's a rally, uh, I know Americans for Prosperity tomorrow, they're going to be holding a demonstration at Reagan National Airport mm -hmm. about the FAA, and, or the sequestration, cutting, cutting of spending, whatnot. I don't know the details, but that's their idea. How would you then push it out to those avenues? Yeah, so um, I think you start by thinking, you know, what, what can I say about this? Um, there are sort of three things you're trying to do at the same time. Like, one is to tell people what is this rally about and why is it important. The second is why should people show up? And the third is how do people show up and get involved? So you have those three, three separate pieces of information. And so you can do sort of a long form backgrounder on why they're hosting this rally and, you know, why it's an important issue. And then you can distribute it on Facebook with a short image, sort of providing this public information campaign. Um, for why people should show up, you could have five reasons why it's important to get out there and protest, or um, photos from past rallies that show there's lots of people there, they look normal, and you want to be part of them too. Um, maybe testimonials, talking about the important work that AFP has done and the great job they do in organizing rallies and why they matter. And so you can publish those as short snippets elsewhere online. And then the third is showing people how to get involved. I mean, you want to make the event as social as possible. So maybe you've done a combination of posting on your website, creating a Facebook event, and inviting people to RSVP there, knowing that's not the substitute for doing the hard work of calling people, organizing, et cetera, et cetera. Created the Facebook event, um, and then asking people to post on Twitter, saying, I'm coming to the rally tomorrow. And every time they post an update on Twitter, you retweet it so all of your followers can see more and more and more people are coming. So it's that combination of sharing the information, making it digestible in different places, and then also building in that social component. Because politics is inherently social. And social media, these different platforms we're talking about, are where people go to talk. So how can you encourage them to talk in a structured way so you can not keep track of it in a negative way, but know who's talking about it, and then amplify their message to show other people, to have them reach out to their networks, and then again keep drawing them back into that home base to you so you can actually organize them and then again have that offline real world effect. So content must be useful and unique. Know your niche, love your niche. Um, so if you're covering a specific issue as an activist organization, there is a level of public education here, right? You know, not everyone wakes up, unfortunately, one day and says, I'm going to read Hayek and Friedman and uh, The Conscience of a Conservative and all these other wonderful books. Uh, sometimes we have to do the hard work of teaching them, especially on public policy issues. So create a niche, become an expert in that niche, and then you'll be advising them and providing this public information. Tell a story with a moral. Um, one, of the, one of the issues in politics is always, of course, motivating people to take action. And so every time you're relaying a story about your activism, about your campaign, there should be some sort of lesson or larger 
idea behind it. Again, to draw on campus reform, frequently the stories are, you know, liberal professors do terrible X, Y, Z, students did A to fight back. The moral of the story being conservative students should stand up to liberal professors. Very often when conservative students fight these battles on campus, they win. It encourages other students to get involved. It encourages parents, alumni, and donors to the university to hold that university accountable. If they're a public university, it encourages the taxpayers to keep a more close eye on what they're doing with their tax dollars. So always have a moral or an outcome because that will help motivate people and especially keeping them aware of your issues in between major events like a political rally. Um, create and abide by a regular schedule. Um, this may be providing information about issues you're working on, um, just sort of keeping that narrative, that storyline going in between the public events that you may be hosting or in between the major events in a campaign cycle. You don't want to be the equivalent of the friend who shows up to uh, send you the birthday card unsigned once a year and the Christmas card. You want to be the friend who's in touch throughout the year and really a part of people's lives. Um, and again, write for the web, brief, short, scannable. Uh, it takes twice as long to read something from a computer screen as it does from a printed page. So you want those sentences short and tight. You want to have headlines that are bolded. And you want to have very, very, very easy and specific action items. So again, the question that Patty was asking, how do we translate this to a rally, for example, you would want to make sure that when you're writing for the web, it's short, it's digestible, and then also I'm telling people immediately what to do. So let's say that someone gets my email. Um, there are going to be a certain percentage, a small number of people who will read every single word. There's a large percentage who are going to be scanning the text. There's a small percentage who are just going to rush through it and then go down to the end. So you want to make sure there's that next specific step you want them to be taking. Um, if you're interested in learning more about online content or blogging, I'd recommend problogger.net. Um, this is more of sort of a long-term investment in content strategy, but I think ultimately it pays off for your organization. So again, it's problogger.net. has a lot of great articles on how to get started and get rolling with this. The second tool that we're going to talk about today is Facebook. Um, Facebook is basically, your mission here is to identify like-minded people and share content with them. Facebook has become the water cooler of the internet. Everyone's there, everyone's hanging out and checks it at least once a day. I mean, I've already checked Facebook today, have you? No, never. Never. I think she's on Facebook right now, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, so Just mission, to let people know that the webinar is happening and right? I hope that people tune in. Yeah, exactly. Um, so your mission, she's trying to find like-minded people and share content with them. I mean, she's living this slide. So same thing on Facebook. Um, the easiest way you can organize people around your common goal or cause is to create a Facebook fan page. I know this will sound incredibly weird, but just Google create Facebook fan page and click the first link you see on Facebook.com. That is the easiest way to find the opportunity to create the Facebook fan page because it's hard to find on Facebook's website itself. Um, when you create the fan page, it's any page you've seen where you like it is a fan page. You create it very similarly to how you created your own profile. You create a profile picture, a cover photo, and you can then post the same updates that you always see. Um, you can invite people to like it, and that sort of helps seed the initial content. And then you can also run ads to direct people to your Facebook fan page. So that would be facebook.com slash ads. Unfortunately, in the limited time on this webinar, we can't cover it in detail. But the good news is it's very, very, very easy again. It's facebook.com slash ads. You can go um, run ads that are targeted by geography by demographics, um, so you know women between 18 to 35, and you can run it on general interest as well. So Facebook will let you target people who specifically like conservative politics, or very, very specifically people who like Barry Goldwater on Facebook, or who like Ronald Reagan, or who like Ron Paul, or who like any one of a, a, a number of related topics to the issues that you're discussing. You run the Facebook ads. Um, it's generally a little image, a little text beside it, very brief. Um, creativity is good, and the best news is that Facebook will again provide a lot of free analytic information and basically do free marketing research for you. So you create a face Facebook ad um, to promote your fan page. You can run 10 to 15 ads and take a very brief amount of time to create them because the creative is very short. And then Facebook's going to be tracking which ones are people clicking on, which ones do people view, which one results in actual likes for the Facebook fan page, and they'll run those ads more frequently on your behalf. You don't have to sit there and refresh and say, oh my goodness, ad three is tanking, pull away the investment from it, ad, put it all in ad one. Facebook's doing that automatically. If a consultant came up to you and said, I can run your social media strategy, and they said, we're going to use Facebook, Twitter, and your website, would you say, go right ahead, use that consultant, pay them whatever they're asking, or would you say, it's easy to learn it on your own, take the time, and have a volunteer do it? I would say, um, depending on the size of your organization, take the time and have a volunteer do it. 
Um, it will definitely require an investment of time um, and definitely a, a willingness to sort of commit to building this knowledge. But it is, I mean, these platforms are friendly. And again, if you remember that the, the beautiful and demystifying part of social media is that it's reflecting things we've always done in politics. It's reflecting ways we've always communicated effectively, motivating voters or supporters, um, reaching out to new people, finding volunteers. It's taking all these processes we've already done, we already know how to do as people involved in politics and the conservative movement, and just transferring them online with new tools. So the tools may look different, the process, the personalities are the same. And so I think it is something that could be picked up. If you're a large organization with a budget, absolutely outsource it, however professional do it. But if you're a smaller activist organization, you shouldn't feel discouraged or like you have to pay someone to do this. Because at the end of the day, social media is really about making those one-to-one -one connections as we talked about in the beginning. So the most powerful thing you can do is to be telling your story in the most effective way possible. You are the best ambassador for yourself. Um, so there's a couple things that you can do on Facebook that are always kind of fun. Um, one is to be tagging people in posts. This is just a simple way to draw to their attention that you're talking about them, positively or negatively. We do have a good story about the negative. Um, so for the positive, this is a great way to, um, if you're doing a partner working with a partner organization or <coughs> spotlighting somebody who works for a larger organization, you just do the at sign followed by the organization name, their Facebook fan page. The person who manages that fan page will see it, will be more likely to share it, hopefully, um, and draw attention. So it's a great way to just sort of get that, that resource, for lack of a better term. Um, it can also be fun for activism. Um, one example is I used to work at Campus Reform in 2009-2010. We had this great story from Louisiana State University, LSU, about a crazy professor who went on a crazy, crazy, crazy rant in one of the classes. And we had him on video, and it's a very exciting story. So on Facebook, we actually tagged LSU in the post that we wrote about it. And it appeared um, to some LSU fans just by, the relation, by linking those two stories on Facebook and actually drew the university to write a public Facebook note to all of their Facebook fans explaining what the story was about. So it was a great way. It cost us absolutely no money, just a little bit of creativity and time. We were able to force them to apologize, to acknowledge the story, and actually help spread the story that we were covering to a much larger audience than would have been done previously because not everyone who's an LSU fan had heard about it already. But a lot of the ones who did were you know, surprised and did a lot of investigation on their own. Um, another thing to keep in mind when sharing links is basically when you're sharing links on Facebook, you are playing newspaper editor. Uh, links are always more effective when they're paired with a large image. Facebook redesigned their news feed to basically be very, very image focused. If you scroll through and think it's lots and lots of photos, uh, it's not just you. That's the way they want it to be. So, you know, find an eye-catching photo ideally to go with it. But when you're sharing a link, you also want to think about playing newspaper editor. Um, all of the fields that you're sharing are editable. So, for example, if I'm sharing a link, in this case it was leadershipinstitute.org, very clever of me, I know, um, I could click in the body of the text right there, as you see, and then it highlighted to blue, and I could hit backspace and start typing in my own information. I could hit the same thing in the title bar and type in my own information, um, because very frequently the short snippet of, of text that Facebook's going to pull from that site is not going to be the most compelling thing to be liking and sharing there. So I can change that to make it more interesting. Um, so in this case, I could change it from invite you to attend a free informational meeting on Thursday, October 21st to join the Heritage Foundation and the Leadership Institute to learn about whatever this event was about, maybe something related to conservative careers on Capitol Hill. You know, click here to RSVP and to learn more. Um, for more information on Facebook, I'd recommend allfacebook.com. Uh, it's a great resource of sort of everything, everything going on there. But the short and simple key to success on Facebook, uh, images, interesting posts, encouraging people to like and share, and keeping it brief. Uh, if you just analyze your own newsfeed and look at the types of things that people enjoy sharing, they're very image-based, they're very story-based, and when people are liking or sharing them, it's either because they feel strongly positive about it, um, lots of forwarded stories about puppies, um, soldiers, um, like feel-good, happy stories that we enjoy taking part in and sharing and passing on that story. And then it's also stuff that's really, really terrible. Um, stories that make us really angry, stories that make us really upset, stories that show outrageous liberal bias, whatever it may be. And so those two like extremes are, again, creating a strong emotional reaction. So drawing out that emotional appeal, the emotional relevancy of your story is more likely to get passed around. Same thing with, you know, what makes me more likely to go home at the end of the day and tell someone a story about what happened that day? Because it has that strong emotional component. It's a good story. So it's all about storytelling and creating small, small pieces of content 
from your bigger content on your home base that people want to pass on, share, distribute. So Twitter. Um, Twitter is a great sort of breaking news source. It's also a place where a lot of news is passed around very quickly. So your mission is to basically network with the people who are hyper information sharers. And very often, I'll call them hyper digital activists, people who are connected pretty much 24-7, um, interested in politics 24-7, generally have very large networks that, they're distributing, that they are distributing to. And so those are the people who are in the, you know, like a hub and spoke model. They are the center of the hub of a lot, a lot, a lot of spokes of conservative activists. So your mission is to make friends with these people, basically. Um, two pieces of advice, because I always think it's helpful to think about like the big picture strategy and then the small picture tactics, especially because the tactics and the technology change so rapidly, but the big picture strategy advice will generally hold pretty true. Um, this is from Robert Scoble, who has, I think, one of the coolest jobs ever. He's basically an evangelist for a tech company called Rackspace, so he gets to go to tech conferences and talk to people and be smart. Um, once you get recognized that you're good at covering a small niche, then you can build out your brand and talk about other things. So if you're working for an activist organization and you want to motivate people to, um, I don't know, Patty, an example of an activist organization or a protest you've been to. Uh, tax Day Tea Party. Yeah, Tax Day Tea Party. So um, in that case, you know, what would the, I guess the issues you're covering there are ones related to economic prosperity, why free markets work, um, why wealth redistribution is a bad idea. So it's this whole core of small ideas. Remember we talked about earlier, unfortunately not everyone wakes up every day and says, I, I need to go read me some Barry Goldwater to better understand how the world works. So this is where you become an expert and you share and distribute information and you help people see something in a new and different way. Or even for your other activists who maybe don't work on this issue specifically, you provide a level of information, knowledge, and insight that they don't have. You help them solve an information problem. Um, second piece of advice, follow better people. The better your inbound is, the better your output will be, and your output is what people follow. So in this case, it means being very targeted in the number of people you're following, not the number of people, but the, qu <coughs> the quality of the people you're following. Um, if you are organizing a tax day protest in Raleigh, North Carolina, I would recommend following um, North Carolina AFP and their staff. I would recommend following staff from North Carolina state think tanks, on, probably on the right. <laughs> you can follow the ones on the left. They may not support what you're doing. Um, the think tanks on the right, members of the media who report in Raleigh, um, you know, the, the reporter who writes the Under the Dome blog on the News and Observer, which is the news blog that sort of continuously updates throughout the day. Maybe some conservative or free market focused members of the State House and State Senate, which is right there in Raleigh as well. So you're finding people who are your decision makers, who are talking about issues relevant to you, and you're seeing what they're talking about so you can, one, get that in intel, which it pretty much is, and two, become part of that conversation and help influence where that conversation goes. Um, so Facebook is really, really, really about sharing links. In this case, um, this is one guy I always like to point out, Guy Kawasaki. So his kind of shtick is sharing interesting, fun links that people enjoy. So this is kind of almost like the Facebook of Twitter, where it's um, Fashion Daily. One of the reasons I've kept this up for several years is because there's a video of a fancy rat convention. I don't know what a fancy rat convention is, but I want to click that link. So he just constantly provides news and basically serves as a one-man news show, in this case about more interesting and funny topics than many of the serious and important issues we work on in politics. But hey, you get the idea. Lots and lots and lots of news. And you can see the intervals at which he's publishing. 20 minutes, 18 minutes, 10 minutes, 9 minutes. Don't feel like you have to live up to that standard. But it just shows frequent updates of small pieces of information. Um, Robert Scoble, who's the guy I quoted earlier, who works for Rackspace, he also does something similar where he publishes a lot of news, but because he's tried to create, or rather has created, an expertise around a certain technology topics, he'll not only publish links, but he'll be, and you can see the little recycling sign next to each tweet, he'll be retweeting, forwarding on pieces of information from other people because he's basically creating a wealth of knowledge. He's the guy you go to to talk about tech topics because not only does he have his own thoughts, but he knows who else is talking about these topics. So if you're an activist or an activist organization, these are the issues you care about. And so not only do you know your own thoughts about them and you're sharing links to relevant news articles, but you're forwarding on the tweets of people who are reporting on this, people who are... Um, who are writing about their own sort of opinions of this, and then politicians, when they do good things and say good messages, we always like to reward them so we can remind them that uh, they should do the right thing all the time. 
Um, 80% of Twitter engagement is clicking links. So it is really about news sharing, distributing information. It is a very sort of rapid fire information and news sharing network. So you want to be thinking, what information can I be sharing relevant to my topic? How can I repackage my topics, um, the activist topics I work on, to be interesting? Because again, you're going to have these high points in your activist campaign, especially if you're a long-running organization, of a rally, of you know a big protest, of a specific campaign to work for a candidate or to you know hope Hold, hold up signs, whatever it is. You're going to have those high points in the physical narrative, but you've also got to have this ongoing relationship building, this very affordable way to keep in touch with people and keep top of mind and keep in touch with those state legislators and keep in touch with the members of the media and keep in touch with think tank staff. You're going to have all those pieces going. So you're constantly thinking about how do I take what I'm doing, provide information, repackage it in interesting and compelling ways, and be distributing those links through Twitter, and also passing on the news of what other people are sharing, because I want to become an expert in my field, and also social, social media is about being social. If you're just talking to yourself, that's called writing a diary. <laughs> Do you uh, a one of our viewers, Suzanne, has a question. She's talking about how we're basically in an information war with leftist organizations mm -hmm. and campaigns. What can we do in addition to this, to tip the scales in our favor? Is it just a continuation of uh, pushing that information out and us just getting better at it? Do you think we're already good at it? It's just that not enough of us are good at it? What is your opinion? So I think, it, I think it's sort of two components. The bread and, well, let me think about where I want to say that. It's two components. The first is how we package the content. Um, a really interesting example on the right is the National Republican Congressional Committee. The NRCC has picked up a lot of attention recently because they've talked about how they're changing the format of the stories that they share. They have a huge amount of research staff and also you know, regional press secretaries who are constantly doing research on Democratic politicians and the terrible things they're up to and the terrible things their campaigns are up to. Um, and so they would always publish these press releases, always publish these briefs, and they put them online. They're not very interesting to read because they're very text heavy. They're written for an inside baseball audience, and so they weren't getting the widespread distribution online. What they started doing, uh, if you've ever seen the website BuzzFeed, is they are basically repackaging these in BuzzFeed format. So they're inserting like funny, short, animated icons and creating top ten lists. They're creating things that are much more easily digestible. I mean, we could argue the merits. Is this good? Is this bad? Is this a sign of the downfall of civilization or just the way we consume information now because we have so much available to us? That all aside, it can, it's one about packaging information in a way that's compelling. People love lists especially on the internet. It's a weird phenomenon. I don't know what it is. If you put, you know, how to write a blog post, you'll get a good number of clicks. If you write 15 ways to make your blog post better, you'll get more clicks. It's bizarre, it's weird, it's true. So it's packaging. And then the second item is what we talked about way at the beginning. It's creating that level of energy and excitement so we can bump it up through the media spheres, starting with online, bumping it up to traditional, bumping it over again to mainstream media, which is how we know a story has really broken through and gotten national attention. So as activists, not only do we want to be pushing our own stories out there in ways that are easily digestible, but also sharing the stories of allied people on issues that we work with to make sure we're drawing that energy, drawing that attention, creating the water and making it boil because that's the way we're going to keep pushing it up. I think it's nothing but good news for conservatives, really, um, especially when you see the stories that have broken through. You know, we have ones here at Campus Reform Hat that have, um, you have the classic story of, um, Jennings getting, was it Jennings? Getting fired from, what am I thinking of? The pajama bloggers? It's not Jennings. And I'm blanking on his name. Well, you'll remember the story. Um, There's a good, the story up. about the professor, how about the professor who got, who finally lost his job at the school in Florida? Yeah. That's. Exactly. So all of these stories, um, all the James O'Keefe expose videos, all of those started online, were then passed around, and the excitement and energy was created around them, and then the media was basically forced to cover it. So the good news is that we know we can do it on the national level, and it's a lot easier at the local and the state level if you have a small, dedicated group of activists who are willing to just sort of keep the heat on, keep the story going. It's enough to perpetuate that energy, and that's what's going to get it to sort of carry over into mainstream. And a great uh, organization that you can work with to get your story to, to really get some legs and grow into a major national story is, uh, is the Franklin Center. And they are based in Alexandria, Virginia, and they are a great organization. We partner with them on trainings every once in a while, and they have a vast network of citizen journalisms. And it's called Watchdog Wire is their their uh, their program that they're doing that. 
And basically anybody can be a citizen journalist. They teach you how to get FOIA requests. They teach you how to file stories. They teach you how to write the stories, everything that's out there. So if this is something that really interests you, that I would, I would definitely check out the Franklin Center. Yeah, they do, they do great work. And they definitely, I think, teach a lot, especially mm -hmm. on the research writing, writing good stories that didn't get media attention. And that's really, really important. So clicking links, sharing links, sharing information, that bigger question, which was a great one from Suzanne, of how do we distribute our content better, more effectively, especially to compete with the left. Um, so a URL shortener that I mentioned previously, um, a website address is called a URL. They're really, really, really long, <laughs> even if you're directing to a very, very simple and humble blog post. And so frequently what you'll see people do is use a URL shortener. In that case, it just scrunches down a big web address into a smaller one that's easier to click. And it also lets you see analytic information. Whenever I say this in a presentation, people say, oh, but Twitter does this automatically for me. They'll automatically shorten the URL. That is true. But Twitter won't automatically let you see the number of people who have clicked the link, the number of people who have retweeted, i.e. forwarded it on. And so that's why you want to be using sort of your own system. Um, to do it manually, you can use a URL shortener called bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y. If you just go to the website, it's free. It'll crunch it down. And then you can copy and paste any bit.ly link at a plus sign to the end, and you see a page like this, the number of clicks that you produce, the number of total clicks, which is the number of clicks across the entire internet of people who have clicked this URL. Um, and you can see the number of conversations on Twitter or on Facebook. And then down at the bottom, the graph that shows you when people are clicking it. And if you scroll down even further, you can see where people are clicking it from in the world. So there's a huge array of, uh, of information. If you use a free platform, um, there's a litany available, Hootsuite, H-O-O-T, S-U-I-T-E, if you use Hootsuite to distribute tweets, they will shorten it to their own URL shortener, which is Owly, <coughs> O-W dot L-Y. Um, Seasonic has, I believe, J dot M-P, TweetDeck. All of these will use those shortened URLs for you and then show you how many people are clicking, which is just interesting. You know, and it also helps us on these messaging issues. Um, what is the most effective way to talk about economic freedom? Um, what is the most effective way to talk about health care or about whatever the issue is you're working on? How do you message that most effectively? The number of clicks will tell you. It's free marketing research. Um, any one of these platforms are also really helpful. They're free. And they also let you break down the conversation that's occurring in Twitter. Um, right now, I think on my personal account, I follow something like two or 3,000 people, which is way too many people to keep up with individually. And so you can create separate columns for people where you either follow conversations occurring around hashtags, hashtags um, having now permeated mainstream culture because my mom references them. Um, obviously, she's very trendy. Um, has permeated mainstream culture. It's just the hashtag or the pound sign followed by a short agreed upon keyword. So at conferences like CPAC, it was hashtag CPAC 2013. At the Republican National Convention or the Democratic National Convention, they had short agreed upon hashtags as well. And people at those events were talking around those hashtags. They're also sometimes used for humor. Um, and last fall, I want to say it was, around the election, they were also being used for messaging on the right, where a number of activists would agree to coordinate around certain hashtags, and they'd create a little process story in the news media of, you know, activists coordinate around hashtag whatever dominate trending news for the day. Or my other favorite, um, when President Obama announced his re-election, surprise, surprise, he used, you know, hashtag we can't wait for all the great things that Democrats couldn't wait for when he was reelected, and conservative activists hijacked it and was like, we can't wait for affordable energy prices. We can't wait for American jobs. And so it's a great way to just have you know, a little bit of fun. It doesn't take anything but time and creativity, but it does get mainstream attention because social media is now, I think, embedded in campaigns and in the political process, but it's also still new enough that if you can show any sort of coordinated activity occurring around social media, you pass that story on to your local news reporter, they're going to eat it up because they love it, because it seems new and interesting and shiny. And so all it requires is that core coordinated group of people willing to be distributing messages across these platforms in a coordinated fashion, and you've got the one-two hit of one, doing the activism, and two, getting the follow-up news story as a result of it. Now, choosing who you follow on Twitter and who you allow to follow you, can you, two-part question, I guess. <laughs> Should you follow whoever you find interesting or just those that you are wanting your message to, to eventually get to? And then in turn, should you make your, your tweets protected and only accept certain people to follow you, or you should you make it open for everyone to see what you tweet? I think if the issue, if your goal is to be distributing a message, you want to make it public. You want to make it as easy as possible for people to find and distribute that message you're passing on. As far as people you follow, I would say follow as many interesting people as you'd like to. Um, one of the things that I've done personally, because I found it helpful, 
Um, so I love politics, I love horse racing, and I love technology. And those are three very different groups of people, and especially the horse racing and tech crowds, don't always really appreciate my conservative principles, despite my best efforts to persuade them otherwise. And so one of the things I actually did was create a separate Twitter account where I cleaved off um, all my horse racing people and put them in a separate account because they were so different from the rest of my Twitter followers and it's such a small closed community I chose to do that for me personally and so you know at Abby Alger is where I talk about tech and politics and the things I do day to day for work and at MD Pony if you'd like to follow me is about Maryland horse racing um, among like the small 150 people that I follow there who care about horse racing so I would say follow whoever you want make your tweets public um, you want to be as engaged in the conversation as possible, but if you really feel like your political goals and your personal goals are starting to distribute a little bit or separate, you know, don't hesitate to create a separate Twitter account, um, if only for personal purposes. That would be my recommendation. It is a lot to keep up with, though. Um, one last thought, especially if those tweets are public. Uh, the Library of Congress is archiving Twitter, so I hope that my descendants are conservative, so they'll appreciate all my thoughts. Um, the Library of Congress is archiving them, so just sort of like do a level of reflection upon that. These will be archived forever, um, for better or for worse. So the last section we're going to talk about is building relationships, because this is really the currency of the web. The web is just a technology that connected people to people, and it solved the coordination problem of meeting really interesting people who also happen to work in politics, who care about these same issues, but instead of living in Arlington, Virginia, or working in Washington, D.C., they work in Cleveland, Ohio, or uh, God help them, Santa Cruz, California. I used to live there. It's crazy. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's like the last liberal bastion in the country. Super liberal. Um, you know, all these people and connecting them. So how do you build these relationships across the channels we've talked about? Um, building relationships with bloggers. First, find bloggers who write about your niche, whether that's a state, pol state politics, local politics, or a policy issue that you're working on as an activist. Find blogs that aggregate content, that is, take in information from other places and um, then publish it on their own. They don't do a lot of original reporting. They pass on a lot of news, though. And then make friends with them. Where do you find a list of bloggers for each state that, do, that you live in? I know that our webinar viewers are from all over the country. Yeah. How do you, is, there a, is there a directory for conservative bloggers? How do you get that That's information? That's a really good question. Um, so this is a very untechnical answer, which many people find unsatisfying. I just Google. Um, so I'll Google like North Carolina blogs, and then I'll find one and start seeing who they link to, and then look through the rest. And I prefer to do it that way, um, just because one, I enjoy the process of finding new bloggers to read. But two, you can actually get a sense for people, because many people are writing not only on different topics, but also for different motivations and have different interests. So some people love doing like more formal reporting on the process of politics. Some people are dedicated activists who care very deeply about the moral and political implications of the policies they support. And so you can sort of find who these people are and what they care about most, and that will help you relate to them in a very genuine way, because you can identify what they care about most and how you can work together to advance their, their issue that they care about and why they care about it, and also the issue you're working on, which you know to be very important. So I would just use Google um, and start searching that way, and then you know it's just like walking into a room at a party. You meet one person, you start chatting with them, um, and before you know it, you've met half the room. So making friends, comment on blogs. People, organizations exist to have people read what they're putting out there online. So if you start leaving thoughtful comments, that's a great way to do it. Um, linking to them, because remember, just as you're tracking where people are clicking and sharing information that you publish, so are others. Um, there's a really interesting thing called trackbacks, where basically bloggers, including Michelle Malkin, michellemalkin.com, will show the people who are linking to them. So you scroll down to the bottom of her posts, it'll say, you know, see what others have said, and then you see a list of trackbacks there. Um, you include a special URL, basically, a special website address when you link back to her. And then it'll pick up, okay, this blog is listed, linking to michellemalkin.com. This is a great way to get your, uh, get your link in front of the eyes of Michelle Malkin's readers. And then finally, after you've done a little bit of investment, Send them an email, get to know them as a person. Um, by this point, you know, they should recognize your name when it pops up in your email inbox because you've left a thoughtful comment or two. Maybe you followed them on Twitter. Um, maybe you've had a trackback or two display on their website. Whatever it is, um, then you can start building that connection because that person will be valuable to you as an activist, one, as a source of news, and also, two, as a news megaphone, willing to pass on information from you to their own broader audience. Um, Relationships with organizations, as Patty mentioned, the Franklin Center will provide a great amount of news training and information. There may be national activist organizations you work with. I couldn't even begin to list all the conservative organizations who do incredibly, incredibly important work on policy issues. Um, but if you're working at the state level specifically, there are some great ways to find people um, in your state. The first is through a group called the State Policy Network, which is a market of free, free
free market think market, a network of free market think tanks all across the country. So that can get you in touch with the local think tanks, so local policy people. Um, tea party groups, of course, and then your local and state party, the party of your choice, since we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. Um, building relationships with them, using their resources, you know, they write policy papers. I interned at a policy organization in college. They write policy papers and hope that people read them and want people to read them. So if you are the conservative activist who is using the white paper they've put out about why the local um, affordable housing policy is absolutely insane, and it always is, uh, they'll be very happy. So let them know that you're using that, you're using that information they're putting out there, attending their events. Um, a lot of nonprofit organizations that exist for sort of this educational purpose will have public events where they'll bring in speakers or experts or whatever else it may be. Attend those events, show up, say hi, get to know everyone there. It's, it's just sort of the same coalition building that you do in any level of politics. Um, comment and cover um, their events. If you go to a luncheon, talk about it, talk about the speakers. And again, tying it back, this is creating those, those stories, that pieces, those pieces of information that will exist to perpetuate your activist organization around the time of big major public pushes and link to them. And then finally send them emails. I mean, again, working, depending on what state you live in, I've always lived in blue states, unfortunately. Uh, depending on what state you live in, there may be a small number of conservatives and they're probably always happy to have another person to add to the room. And then finally, building relationships with media. Um, love them or hate them, they are social media. So first is to identify your target, which I know sounds kind of creepy, but you need to figure out the reporter who writes about the issue that's most important to you, um, identifying beat reporters of interest. So when I worked for Campus Reform, we cared a lot about the local and state politics people because they would always be interested in the political implications of the stories we were writing, but then also the higher education reporters because they were writing about college news generally. So if you are an activist who works on pro-life issues, um, you may want to figure out who's the political reporter. Um, is there a reporter who writes more broadly, like family or lifestyle type articles that would be of interest when, if you do an event where you talk to, I don't know, you host a fundraising event for a pregnancy crisis center. So finding those different angles where stories could be covered and identifying those beat reporters. And then reading what they're putting out there to understand not only what they write about, but how they write about it. Some people prefer facts and numbers and want to be investigative journalists. Some people prefer human interest stories and want to have a compelling narrative. The more you understand about how they write, the better and more effectively you'll be able to pitch them, share your story, draw attention to your organization and to your event, which only does good things for your organization and your cause by keeping that, I don't know, snowball picking up steam, mixed metaphor, moving down a hill. Um, how do you make friends with the media? Comment again on what they're writing. Um, reporters now face a lot of pressure to be constantly producing content online over the course of the day, and many are measured by the number of page views, i.e. the number of people who are clicking through to the website and loading a page that has their article on it. So if you're commenting and leaving an intelligent comment, which you will, um, or if you're linking and generating traffic, you are indirectly giving that reporter money. So you want to be linking in, you want to be sharing their stories when they're good or when they're bad. Um, and then finally, emailing them with good stories. If you've done your homework, you've been commenting, you've been sending them web traffic, you know what they care about, then you can pitch your story about your rally or your candidate or your issue. Or, you know, let's say that you work as an activist organization and a bill is coming up and you want state legislators to vote a certain way. You can write the story, you know, leading up to it, why this fight is important the process story of how local citizens are fighting against this, um, you know, the, the grand recap of your big public event that you've been able to publicize, the number of people who showed up, and then finally afterward, you know, rewarding the good or punishing the bad um, based on how they voted. So really quickly, how to avoid common mistakes in online activism. Um, the first is picking a target too high. We'd all love to influence President Obama, but he's probably too high and too insulated from us. Picking a target too broad. I want to change... Uh, I don't know, the economy, too broad. You generally want people to coalesce around a very specific action, um, especially because two, we're very sort of quick online, lose attention quickly. You want to have a specific art action with a specific target because you can very quickly move people along, ask them to perform specific actions, track who's doing that, and continue moving forward to the goal. Message bombing which is the equivalent of like basically just copying and pasting and getting people to send 10,000 emails into your local members, member of Congress. Um, this is a term I made up. The example I like to give since I have younger siblings is it's a phenomenon where you're in a car with little kids and you know your brother's sitting there poking your arm over and over again. You know, at first it's really annoying, Patty's over hand at me, but after a while if I had done this to Patty the entire webinar, she would stop. She would stop paying attention. 
Um, it's the same thing with message bombing. You know, the power of the web isn't that you can say the same thing over and over and over again a lot of times because eventually we drown that out. You become noise, not signal. The power of the web is a lot of individuals can tell compelling individual stories, publish and distribute those, and create a more effective message because poking patting the arm right there over and over again, she can, time, she can stop paying attention to that, but if I poke her here and then here and then here, she'll slap my face. Um, no, I would never do She that. would never do that. She's too much of a lady. Um, you know, that, that she can't ignore. Um, not building relationships. We talked a lot through sort of these long-term investments of how to build relationships, build up platforms, build up stories, uh, or sorry, build up distribution platforms. So when you do have a good story, you do have a major event as an activist, you can then basically you've lined up all your dominoes and you can knock them down. So really quick example to close out the webinar. Um, what's your very specific goal? I want Senator <coughs> Green to vote yes on Bill 2. Insert in here, you know, the issues you care about most. Who's the decision maker? Senator Green and his staff. I need to slightly terrify them a little bit. Um, who are my natural allies? Local taxpayer and civics groups. We're leaving this very open-ended as an example. How can I apply pressure, creativity, and experimentation? So thinking about the tools um, that we've worked on. So maybe on my website or my blog, I list a very long post about all the reasons that Bill 2 is terrible. And I make sure to carefully annotate it and reference the local think tank that's done research on it so that when I want to pass this story off to the media, the homework's been done for them. They know these numbers are valid, they know this logic is valid, and even if they don't agree with it, they do know it's a well-researched and defensible position. So I start online with this long list of <clears throat> all the reasons that Bill 2 is important. And then I start, I repackage it. Um, let's say that Bill 2 is related to local land use regulations. A very boring topic in general, but to specific groups of people I can target it. So I can say the top 10 reasons this matters for hunters because it's going to affect land conservation. Um, the top 10 reasons this affects property owners. The top 10 reasons this affects the local, I don't know, instant another conservative interest group here, local taxpayers. So I take that big core piece and then I start distributing it in chunks. And I create it into breakable chunks, and then I distribute that through Facebook or through Twitter, talking to those people, and I ask allied organizations to do the same to their people. Um, using Twitter, uh, let's say that I ask people to tweet Senator Green, asking him why he won't vote yes on Bill 2. And maybe I send out an email to my email list or to conservative activists I work there, you know, suggesting why don't we ask Senator Green why he wants to raise taxes on the local tax taxpayers of Arlington, Virginia, or why he doesn't care about Second Amendment rights, or why he doesn't care about protecting our heritage, or why he doesn't, you know, you list off 10 to 15 reasons, you let people find an individual reason, an individual story. Um, you can film YouTube videos where you uh, either try to interview Senator Green, which is always funny when people get those gotcha videos of politicians asking him why he doesn't care about this issue or asking one of your gotcha questions. Or you can film you know, testimonials from people who are going to be affected. Because remember, we respond to individual stories. And the left does this incredibly, incredibly well. They find victims, they put them in front of a camera, and we all feel bad inside. Do the same thing for our side. And so you can do all of these different pieces. And I always leave this very open-ended because you understand the strategy. You understand what's going to make you effective in the big picture. And it's now figuring out through creativity and through experimentation how to use and align these different tools in different and interesting ways, never forgetting the Google Alerts phenomenon, which is if you go to google.com slash alerts, you can set it up so every time you're mentioned online, an email is sent to you. Every single elected official has that Google Alert set up on their name. So as soon as you start talking about them, their ears go up and they start paying attention. And the bigger the platform that you've been building and the more relationships you've been building, the more those ears are going to go up and then they start to get a little nervous. And when they get a little nervous, that's when we know we've got them, because if they can't see the light, we can always make them feel the heat. And the web and online activism are a great way to crank up that heat with a few dedicated activists, creativity, time, and not a lot of cost, which is why I think it's really awesome. So three big activism ideas. First, break through the noise of contacting Congress or you know, your local elected officials. Um, this is a story on an old school Facebook fan page, but it still applies. Patrick McHenry is a Democratic politician from North Carolina. Republican. Republican Congress. Thank you. Um, from North Carolina. Um, in LA a, trained. LA, oh, really? I didn't say that on camera. <laughs> of course he's LA trained. <clears throat> in a congressional hearing, he was questioning Elizabeth Warren, who's going to be the head of President Obama's Consumer Financial Protection Video Bureau. She's now you know, a member of Congress herself, a member of the Senate. However, he questioned her and said, you know, you're lying or called her a liar. 
So liberal activists, being very rational, calm people, decided to storm his Facebook fan page and tell him you know, how terrible he was. And you'll notice these, these messages aren't copied and pasted the same thing over and over again. It's a lot of people motivated to write their own specific reason of why they specifically hate Congressman McHenry. So this was one, terrifying to his staff because you have your Facebook fan page overrun by people who are very, very angry with you. And number two, became a national news story because remember, members of the media, they absolutely love social media and new media stories. So they saw this as a digital protest. They got very interested. They picked it up. And what was a very offhanded comment in a small congressional hearing that many people probably were not tuning into live was totally blown up by the left. And with a bunch of people just sitting at home typing away a brief Facebook message, they mobilized their network. They got them to go. And so this is a great way to, again, have that sort of digital rally where you encourage people to come together on a certain place online, sharing their thoughts related to an issue, and forcing a response by, again, turning up the heat. Um, second, telling a policy story with multimedia. Many of the issues we work on as activists, you know, we, we often say that we have all the facts on our side. We just need to meet, make people understand. A great way to do that is by breaking down stories. Um, during the 2008 financial crisis, this guy, the mouthpiece, created a great YouTube video that took an incredibly complicated story <coughs> of how everything seemed to melt down overnight, broke it down into you know, dramatic music and news flashes, and sort of told this whole story from a more free market, right-leaning perspective. Over a million people saw it because it was a great way to take a complex issue and break it down to something we could all understand in bite-sized pieces using multimedia. Another one that I'm confident most of you have seen is the 10,000 pennies video. When President Obama was first elected, he made a pledge to cut waste, waste and fraud from the federal budget. And so this guy did this great video where he actually laid down the pennies that show the size of the federal budget. He drew lines showing what's entitlement spending and everything else. And then at the end, you know, you watch him over the course of this whole video, this minute and a half, and fast forward, pick up one single penny, take pliers, cut like a quarter out of it, and say, and this is what President Obama is talking about cutting from the federal budget. We, as just as humans have a really hard time understanding really, really small numbers and really, really big numbers. A lot of political spending is really, really big numbers. And so this kind of visualization is just like, oh my god, you see the quarter of the penny and you realize this huge number in millions or billions isn't actually that big after all. And then finally, researching, publishing, being the media. This is something where you can work with the Franklin Center a lot. A lot of the stories that we are working on, a lot of the issues that we are working on as activists, the media isn't covering them. Um, either because they don't want to or because they don't have the resources. And so you can be the media. You can tell these important stories that relate to the issues that you work on. Um, there's a ton of records online. One example I love to give, if you remember the John Edwards $400 haircut story with the I Feel Pretty video, which is always really funny, that came from somebody digging through FEC reports on campaign expenditures. Um, another place of petty tyranny is definitely your local government. So I'd recommend te checking out like town council, local council meetings if you aren't sure where to start, and just see the crazy stuff they're doing to your friends and neighbors and with your tax dollars that you're paying you know, every year. Um, most of those are archived online, and so it's a great resource of information to pull together, to tell a compelling story, to relate it to your core issue, and then to distribute it through all the channels that we've talked about. So that's it. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Well, Abby, thank you so much. I just have one last question. Why didn't you put a single cat in your presentation? Because cats are loners, and dogs come together. Also, dogs are way cuter. Also, if I put cats, everyone I'm going to stop assume. you before you offend everyone else who is watching this. But seriously, thank you for presenting today. It was very interesting and very informative. And I want to thank everyone who tuned in today. I hope that you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned a lot that you can now apply to, your act to the activism ideas in your life. Uh, this was recorded, and you will be able to watch archive versions in the beginning of next week. I want to invite everyone to our next webinar, which will be on Wednesday. May 8th at 7 p.m. See you then. Thanks again.